Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us in this flip format. We appreciate your patience and, and participation. And uh, we are glad that you're, you're listening to us and look forward to the really great events uh, of this afternoon. So we had a lot of great, really great proposals for the event today. And the names of all who submitted proposals are listed in the program. So you can reach out and find out more. Uh, our colleagues have really interesting and innovative and creative practices that really do warrant sharing. But due to time constraints, we could only choose four presentations. But I'm gonna give you a brief overview of some of the interesting work being done. So we've got Mark Stevens. He is going to talk to us about the experiencing confidence and enjoyment of learning, the Excel program, which uh, works with high DFU rate courses and serves approximately 2,500 students. This is a social emotional intervention that has shown success in encouraging our students to seek academic support. It helps create a sense of belonging, fosters a growth mindset. It will uh, help to increase academic confidence and help students remember their purpose, remember why they're here. So I think that's an interesting one. So we've got uh, Debbie Mercado and Trista Payne from the Learning Resource Center. They're gonna showcase two different ways that the LRC supports the CSUN students. First of all, it's the Grammar Lab, and who doesn't need the Grammar Lab? This helps students who, need, um, who are in need of language support, and they're also gonna talk about the ways they help the students who are re registered with the National Center on Deafness and the Writing Center. The Writing Center has the online writing lab and it assists students by meeting them where they are through both synchronous and asynchronous means. So our third presentation today is David Dufo Hunter and Tatiana Ortega coming to us from admissions and records with two different proposals. One of these showcases the technology that a &R uses to empower students in planning their degrees and one that highlights the importance of belonging for our students. So help in planning is something that really, really matters. Our students really benefit from seeing that roadmap in front of them. Um, you know, it's nice to see where they are and nice to see that there's a finish line somewhere along the way. Um, now, we also have faculty such as Jessica Beatty McMillan and Lucy Drake who highlighted the ways that community-based learning has encouraged student learning and engagement. And they'll tell us about how that is translated into understanding the relevance of what they are learning within the greater community and within their uh, professional goals. At the end. Okay, so what am I, what am I talking about? So I've gotten them mixed up. It's my fault, sorry. These are all These are not the words. That could have been pointed out more clearly. Okay. Let me correct what I'm saying here, I'm sharing with you some of the interesting proposals that I hope you will reach out. They are not included in the ones presented today. I thought I was telling you about the ones that you will hear from, uh, but I've been on virus duty for the last week, so I feel a little behind. Okay, so let me go back to the ones that you are not gonna hear about today, but are very valuable. So faculty such as Jessica Beatty McMillan and Lucy Drake, who are talking about community-based learning, uh, how that encourages student learning and engagement, and how that is translated uh, into understanding the relevance of what they're learning with the greater community and their professional goals. Okay, the, I'll also say the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences wanted to share with us how they have taken a comprehensive college-based approach to uh, looking at, at student success. Okay, last on my list of, of programs that will not be presented today, but are very valuable, are Richard Cardona from the Oasis Wellness Center, who identifies how health barriers, and this is really important for all of us, such as stress, high-risk behaviors, and sleep disturbances, how that can affect student achievement. 
and how these areas can be addressed to improve student success. And I, I think we all ought to hear more about that. So that's just a snapshot of the work going on. So do look at the program to see more. I want to take a minute to thank everyone who submitted a proposal for their time and their effort and their dedication. The program committee listed in the program selected four presentations as a representation of some of the ways that the campus across units has been supporting student success and as a means to share a few strategies for you to use in your daily work with students. So now each of these presentations will be no more than 30 minutes long. And so you're gonna hear the chimes at the end of 20 minutes. So we'll save time for Q and A. Uh, thank all of you who've stuck with us this throughout this academic year so far, as we've done these student success uh, series of events. So we look forward to, uh, to sharing with you, continuing these conversations uh, later on. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for participating. My name is Laura Wimberly and I'm the assessment librarian at Oviat. I'm here today with my colleague. Hello everyone, my name is Yiding and I'm the online instruction design librarian also with the Oviat Library. Um, and today we're gonna to be talking about how the Oviat Library helps first year students in particular succeed. <clears throat> And the thing I want everyone to leave here today knowing is that students who check out books and technology equipment from the library earn more credits in their first year and they're more likely to come back for their second year. And all of you, faculty, advisors, counselors, all of you can easily encourage your students to take advantage of the library. Um, <clears throat> We're going to be talking about resources for you to be able to do that. And we're going to talk about how we know that we have this impact all across campus. Um, the way we know this is based on the study I did as part of the Data Champions Project, um, culminating in May 2019. And I want to particularly thank Janet O oh and the staff at the Institutional Research Office for their support and help in making this possible. Um, because the study did not go through the Institutional Review Board for Human Subjects approval, um, we did it as a part of internal institutional improvement only. Um, I can only submit it through channels like this one internal to the institution, so um, the re full report isn't publicly posted, but I'm happy to email a full copy of the report to any CSUN faculty or staff who wants one. Um, so we were able to do this study um, on the first time freshmen in fall 2019. 2017, all of them, in part because we had data from our new library system called ALMA that was newly implemented across the California State University system libraries, all of them. And for the first time, we had a record of each item checked out by each of our students. Um, so this record is only of the tangible books and media that they checked out. So even though ebooks are 90% of the usage, they're not included in this study because our ebooks can be accessed by anyone on the EduRome Wi Fi system or on any desktop on campus without logging into an individual account. So there's a great deal of usage of these resources that isn't tracked to any individual user. We don't want to put up any barriers to use that aren't necessary. Um, so we've excluded ebooks from the study because there's a lot of use that hasn't been accounted for to a specific individual. So right now we're looking at our print books, which our student user survey studies show uh, are still preferred for a lot of kinds of content by um, students across all the colleges. Um, we're looking at print books, tangible media like DVDs, um, all of our equipment, laptops, tablets, calculators, and the more exotic equipment we have in the Creative Media Studio. That includes our green screens, our DSLR cameras, um, our uh, use of time in the 
um, recording studio, um, and all of that kind of multimedia production equipment. Um, and we've combined all of that data from our library system, Alma, with data from institutional research, demographic data on each individual student, gender, whether they're a member of a traditionally underserved or traditionally better served ethnic group, um, whether they're Pell Grant eligible, um, academic data, which college they're enrolled in and their high school GPA, and of course their student success outcomes, um, whether they were retained from their first year into their sophomore year, and how many credits they earned just during that first year at CSUN. So we've measured this, I've grouped these by the variables of interest. One is the use of library technology services. That's just those basic laptops and tablets um, combined with those more um, creative um, technologies available at the creative media services. Um, two, use of course reserves. We've broken that out specially. It's the most popular particular for, particularly for first year students. So the use of course reserves, physical items, and then the use of other collections. That includes our general collections and the main stacks, um, anything they called out from special collections, anything they borrowed through interlibrary loan, the map library, everything else we have. Um, and then our control variables, um, the dependent variable here is re-enrollment in fall 2018. And so the statistical method is logistic regression because we have this binary dependent variable. Um, you can see we have an extremely detailed result here. There's obviously a constant included in this, but I didn't list it for space because we already have a pretty limited uh, display area. Um, but you can see the results here um, are highly statistically significant and um, show that the more books and media a first year student checks out of Obiat Library, the more likely they are to return for their sophomore year. That's true of both general stacks and it's true of the reserve collection. And this is an extremely robust finding um, to a variety of specifications, whether I leave in the college variable or I take it out, whether we merge reserves in the general collection or take them out. Um, interestingly, the use of the technology services does not predict retention one way or the other, but the use of the book and um, media collection absolutely does. It's highly significant. Um, if we also, we can also directly measure students' um, timely progress to graduation using these same variables of interest and the same control variables. Um, we can see that here the dependent variable is the credits earned just during their first year at CSUN. So we're not counting any AP credits they might have come in with. And the method here, since that's a continuous variable, is the ordinary least squares regression. And here we can see that all three measures of library use um, the technology services, the general books and media, and course reserves are highly significant positive predictors of credits earned by students in their first year. Um, and you can see that this is actually quite a large impact. Um, this reserves use is individual items checked out. Um, so just checking out one item of course reserves twice predicts an entire unit earned over comparable students who didn't use course reserves at all. Um, and for such a small intervention, that's a very large impact. Um, or using, um, checking out any book or media, it would have to be 10 times um, to indicate, but that's still a sm fairly small intervention when you compare the size of this coefficient to some of the other um, things that we know are important and what a smaller intervention it is compared to some of the other interventions we would have to undertake. So these are very powerful. Course reserves has an extremely powerful impact on um, credits earned. Uh, we do want to think that you know this N here again. It's five thousand two hundred and fourteen. That's the entire entering first year class in fall twenty seventeen. I did wonder whether perhaps um, students who did not return, you know, they drop out very early. They didn't have a chance to check anything out. So I reran this with just the students who were retained into fall 2018. And these are still very highly 
positive um, significant predictors of credits earned. So even if we only look at those pool of students who were retained, there's still a significant impact of um, use of technology services, use of general collection, and use of course reserves. Um, <coughs> again, constants were included in all these regressions, just not shown for space. So, um, we also know we have a rough measure of how the library can indirectly, we have a rough indirect measure of um, timely progress to graduation based on our student survey in November, eight, uh, November 2018, um, where we asked students to recall on this survey whether they had library instruction. Um, and we can see that here um, on this uh, smaller study um, that students who remember receiving library instruction, it does positively predict um, timely, uh, highly significant, highly robust predictor of timely progress to graduation. Um, we are uh, collaborating with a CSU-wide study um, more rigorously designed um, to measure um, the impact of library instruction on uh, first year student retention and um, credits earned that will act directly measure whether students receive library instruction and will not require, will not rely on um, student recollection or on voluntary survey participation. But our current results are positively suggesting that this might be um, a useful in intervention. So how can you put this knowledge to work? Obviously our first ask is for here is for faculty, please put all of your assigned readings on course reserve. The link is right here, library.csun.edu slash course reserve slash reserve materials. Reserves can include items that are already in the library collection. We'll set them aside. Otherwise your most eager students will snatch them up and they can now check them out for 16 weeks at a time. Um, we can purchase new print books to meet class need um, that's supported by a campus quality fee that the uh, university student that the university students choose to support um, and we can also newly purchase ebooks to meet class needs again that's not included in the study but it's a popular choice for reserves um, or if you have faculty owned items especially maybe if a publisher gives you extra desk copies we'll be happy to take those and return them to you at the end of the semester or whenever you complete teaching the class um, we can recreate your illegal coffee shop course packs. Some people are still relying on those and they did used to be the cheaper option for students, but remember students can't use their uh, financial aid to buy from a coffee shop on Reseda Boulevard or anything like that. So um, uh, let us just let us know what you're teaching with and we can purchase new items. Um, this really does make a big difference to your students. Um, we also want to encourage you, uh, the library wants to encourage you to assign projects that engage the library. Um, I hope this encourages you, especially the findings about the use of the general collection, to consider encouraging the use of books as well as scholarly journal articles, especially in first year courses. Um, frequently, um, students feel intimidated by the length of books. We as librarians often want to encourage them that books frequently have a little more uh, background context and can be a little bit more accessible. Sometimes the browsing of the serendipity of the stacks, seeing what's next to each other, um, can be a more helpful process than just searching for some first year students. Um, so, you know, obviously this is field dependent, but please consider this option when you're creating your assignments. And consider multimedia projects that make use of the Creative Media Studio. Um, a podcast, an interview, documentary or creative photography, um, model, puzzle, or prop creation with any of our 3D printers, um, music or video. For example, I went to speak to the psychology department with my colleague um, Ding here, and uh, one of the professors told us they assigned a project of making public service announcements as part of their classes and that's a great use of the creative media studio that will engage students um, and please always remember you can ask your subject specialty for your subject specialist for help they will have suggestions about how to integrate books or tech into your assignments we will teach your students how to access the books you don't have to remember how to teach them how to use the library of congress call number system that's our job um, and we can help you get items on reserve if you're not sure how to link the existing ebook into canvas or anything like that we're here for you for advisors, please remember you can refer struggling students for one-on-one -on -one help. 
So every major has a liaison librarian. We are happy to meet with your students one-on-one. -on -one. We can do it in person, but if that's not advisable, especially right now, we can do it via email. It's a great way to um, send a lot of content to them on the phone or by Zoom. Um, and we can help students, especially who might be need to finish outstanding incompletes with research projects or who are struggling with research projects. Um, we know that this is a new thing, especially for first year students. It's an overwhelming number of resources and we are here for them. Um, for counselors, um, one thing that we did, this is um, something that I helped create, but most of the work was done by my colleague, Jamie Johnson. We've created a new guide here. These, we call these lib guides and we have them for all the majors and many individual courses, but we created one um, with books for each of the counseling groups that we thought might be helpful. So um, we've got examples here. You can take a look. We would love recommendations. We might have a little bit of funding left in our popular reading collection if you'd have specific books that we think would be helpful. And we were hoping that your uh, self-help library that's linked from the Counseling Center webpage um, might link to some of the books. Um, and that would be a good way to encourage students to, to read more of the resources in the library. Um, <clears throat> So please remember, students who use the library earn more credits in their first year and come back for their sophomore year. We think it, um, even using course reserves at that basic level gets them in the process of using the library. They understand about checking stuff out. They feel empowered to do that. It sets them up for the research process in the future. Um, it engages them in our community space. It makes them feel part of the campus. Um, you know, our place is always vibrant, it's always full, and we hope that makes them feel part of the university. Um, and it just gets them feeling competent as researchers. It's the first step to use the library for anything is the first step of feeling mastery over the university. Um, so please, if you have questions or feedback, I would love to hear them. We have a question. Great. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the Creative Media Studio and what other projects faculty have done? Um, what other projects faculty have done? Um, so students use the Creative Media Studio for all kinds of stuff. Um, um, so we're pulling up, um, let's see. So there's an on-site recording studio. Um, people have done podcasts and interviews, have definitely been part of it. Um, uh, people have made films, um, short films. Um, they can check out the equipment out of the library, so they can use GoPros um, or traditional video cameras to make any kind of film. Um, and I know for my kinesiology faculty, sometimes they will ask students to um, record a experiment or um, some observation they have done, so they will actually use this equipment to do that, so that they can accurately measure um, and the physiological um, factors of uh, sports, for example, and to complete assignment, to do better training for um, their um, clients. And we're gonna share actually a link um, in the chat about the Creative Media Studio service. If you'd like to know more, you can contact them. Um, that's about it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I misspoke. Um, apparently, somebody from financial aid is correcting us to say that students can use their financial aid to purchase books or copies from outside vendors. Okay. Um, so, I thank you, Emily. I appreciate that. I'm sorry that I misunderstood that, but uh, reserves is still free to the students, so that's going to be one better <laughs> if we can make that happen for them. We have another question. Uh, what number of resources do you recommend for freshman level classes? What number of resources? Like what, yeah, which... Which resources do you specifically do you, do you recommend for freshmen? How many? How many resources? Right. Um, we really think it really depends on different colleges and departments and also the specific course objectives. But we'd like to work with you if you do have a syllabus or at least some <laughs> objectives in mind um, to contact your subject librarian to talk about that. Do you have a specific yeah. answer? No, I mean, I think it depends definitely on the length of the reading, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I think there are going to be um, courses where, 
you read a hundred different things because they're short poems or you know brief newspaper articles and other courses where you just use one big substantive textbook. So I think, you know, in terms of number of resources, I don't think there's any set answer. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if you come to your subject librarian with some, um, with some, some student learning outcomes, we can definitely help you find the right resources to meet those. Right. Okay, so with that, we're going to move on to our second presentation. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. I am very happy to follow my uh, wonderful former library colleagues with the talk also that, that will be about uh, technology. My name is Helen Heinrich and I'm Director of Data and Analytics in Information Technology. And I'm Joyce Marie Brasosko. I'm a lecturer in Family Consumer Sciences and Child and Adolescent Development. And I'm also a student at the uh, doctoral uh, education leadership program at uh, CSUN and I'm completing my doctoral studies. My research is focused on faculty decision making as it related to technology. And I finished, I completed my dissertation this summer in August 2019 on the sense of belonging of Latinx commuter students here on campus. So today we will talk about Canvas Insights, a new tool custom built at CSUN that leverages Canvas data and allows faculty to easily communicate with individual students based on an earlier alert. To set the context for uh, Canvas Insights, uh, we need to go back to the uh, graduation initiative 2025 when it uh, first uh, appeared. When GI 2025 arrived, one of the early CSUN strategies uh, at meeting those ambitious goals was to increase the use of data in decision making. At about the same time, uh, Canvas was selected as a new learning management uh, system. And one of the reasons it was selected is because it had uh, data available um, in the form of uh, analytics. And that uh, those analytics could be viewable at the individual student or assignment level. So it seems uh, very uh, powerful to look in that area of data avail availability and use that technology. So by now, uh, Canvas has been adopted by about 86% of faculty. So leveraging Canvas data is a really important way of reaching faculty and students through technology. While Canvas certainly had some uh, analytics available, we also heard from faculty with the request for additional analytics capabilities. For example, faculty wanted to have the ability to combine uh, several parameters and uh, find students who, who missed or were late with several assignments at a time. They also wanted to combine more categories, not just the late or missed assignments. And further, uh, faculty wanted the ability to create uh, emails, uh, reach out to students uh, with personalized uh, messages. So with that in, in mind, um, information technology in collaboration with uh, academic affairs, we developed Canvas Insights, uh, that, a tool that is available only for uh, CSUN faculty. So we took the filters that were available already in Canvas and added more parameters, such as multiple assignment groups and assignment names within that assignments group as well as where the students check syllabus or uh, gradebook. 
We also created an email functionality that allows faculty to send messages personalized with the students' first names. We created two types of editable email templates that both are based on the, uh, based on the growth mindset language. One type uh, is for students who need some help and another one who students who, uh, where faculty would like to provide positive uh, feedback. So this is how uh, the Canvas and Size dashboard looks in Canvas. All faculty have access to it through uh, Canvas learning management system uh, through the link on the left navigation pane. You can see to the right that there is a num number of filters and parameters that allow faculty to combine all of them up and down or use just a single one of them. Many of them are two-way sliders which allow faculty to find students in the lower, middle, or uh, top range of uh, performing students. So once faculty uses one or many of those filters, like you can see here, for example, total grade and some of the assignments, the list of students is recalculated to respond to the filters. And at this point, uh, once faculty uh, select the list, they can move from inside of the course, literally, to take an action by emailing students. When faculty decide to email students uh, the, for the first time, the first thing they will see is actually a pop-up message that offers them help as how to create an early, early alert message. And if, um, if faculty decide to follow that message, they will be connected to the faculty development resource page on early uh, alerts. Um, if not, the link will always stay there, uh, available as a resource for faculty. Now faculty at this point have a drop down menu uh, that lists two types of messages. By selecting, depending on the filters that they use, by selecting one of them, the message, the template message pre-populates with the uh, editable text that is based on the growth uh, mindset. Each type of message also gets personalized by the student first name and the faculty last name. And um, as the course progresses and faculty provide more outreach, the system keeps uh, track of what uh, type of messages and what students the messages were uh, sent to in the history of messages. Now, um, as of spring 2020, Canvas Insights is available to all faculty through, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Canvas Learning Management Systems. But before that, we ran uh, two uh, pilots for the tool. We partnered with undergraduate studies who helped us identify the pilot faculty and uh, we ran the first pilot in spring 2019 and then in the fall fall 2019 we also partnered with faculty development and they taught um, workshops on how to create positive messages on earlier alerts so as i mentioned uh, it's now available for to everyone as of now we more than almost 1200 personalized messages were sent to 980 students and the messages uh, by individual faculty ranged by the, from the number from the numbers like only two messages to 389 by individual faculty. What we heard uh, as a feedback from faculty is that uh, the response rate of students by students as a result of the outreach through Canvas Insights increases by about 50%. And some faculty also uh, shared the responses that they received uh, from students. As you can see, uh, many of them, uh, many of the students' voices uh, primarily express their gratitude uh, for the outreach and also the sense of relief that they can really still um, can succeed uh, in the course. 
those uh, student voices basically uh, provide confirmation of what scholarly research already suggests, which is that faculty feedback is one of the most important factors of improving learning process, and that early alerts interventions improve student outcomes, as well as uh, personalization optimizes learning process. What is also important that this creates a sense of belonging, uh, which can have a positive impact on uh, student retention. So I'm going to turn it over to Joyce Marine, who has been uh, our pilot faculty from the very beginning, and she helped us to shape, shape the tool and provide faculty perspective. She's going to share how she used the tool and how she views it through the lens of her research on sense of belonging. Thank you, Helen. So that's correct. I was chosen as to be a faculty user because I teach one of the high DFU classes, Family Consumer Sciences 340, Marriage and Family Relations. I taught this in the spring of 2019 in Jacaranda Hall in Johnson Auditorium with 110 students. So I used a uh, Canvas Insights as a tool to quickly identify a handful of students who were actually falling behind in submitting work into the class. So I quickly, out of the 110 students, I was able to identify 10 students that needed um, additional uh, alert that they were falling behind. Uh, the, I used the default message which read, I noticed that you are currently not doing as well as I know you can and I would like to help Let's talk about how to improve. Please contact me so we can develop a plan. That is the default message that I use that's available in Canvas Insights to open up a conversation with the student. Once I sent those emails out, this five students, well, eight students responded and five students I actually met with on a personal level, but here's a couple of their responses that they said. I appreciate you reaching out to me regarding my current progress in the class. Can I meet with you for 15 minutes before the start of class? Or thank you for reaching out to me. I would greatly appreciate your help. And then the last one, well, several of them came in. I just chose three to talk about. Good afternoon, Professor. I would like to fix this as well. It is possible to meet you during office hours on Thursday. So but as you send out these personal messages, the students actually respond back to you. And this is how they responded back. So I was actually able to meet with five students in my classroom or in my office and one-on-one -on -one meetings. And there in my one-on-one -on -one meetings with the five students, I was able to provide an atmosphere where I listened to them, I cared for them, I accepted them, I respected them, and I valued them as being important process of our learning community in our classroom. So what I know from extensive research, and I'll show you a slide in just a moment, about the sense of belonging is that it's really important to create a positive interconnectedness with other individuals and certainly students. So one of the important part about this too is that students perceive support, perceive classroom com uh, comfort and perceived faculty support can actually increase the student's decision to return to campus the next semester. So the part that we are actually perceived in this message that we are reaching out to them to be a part of a plan to help them actually succeed um, provides lots of support and a sense of belonging to those students. So part of my research on the Latinx commuter students who have persisted and their sense of belonging that I finished um, this summer, I, was, I did an extensive research review of literature on the sense of belonging and persistence by Tinto and Tierney and lots of other people. And what I learned in my extensive review of literature is that the sense of belonging um, has three different sections, home, school, and work. And I just wanna focus just here on the school part of where we are. Um, and I'll talk about this. And I looked at first year sense of belonging, marginalized students, Latinx students, and really our, our part here at CSUN is in the school part and then specifically the faculty and how we can help. The specific area and how we can help as faculty members is looking at attendance at school, class participation, and assignment completion. And this is where the Canvas Insights really 
helped me identify those 10 students relatively quickly to complete their assignments to be able to pass the class. Um, so it fell very nicely into my research, actually. And what we also know for research um, from Rendon's work about faculty being validation agencies, agents. Um, as a sense of belonging, where we're listening to the students, we're listening to their concerns, we're offering up campus resources, which we are going to hear from more today, and there are lots of resources here on campus, problem solving some sort of strategy with the student to improve their grade, and actually modeling intrapersonal communication skills with the student. Um, just in case you didn't know what intrapersonal skills are, um, I have a small definition here, but it's basically about understanding your own personal feelings and your own self-knowledge about yourself. One of the things that we recognize is in our Latinx community here, students aren't necessarily uh, understand that they're aware that they actually do have a second chance and that they might actually be in jeopardy of failing the class. And much like what Dr. Sumi said in our last uh, student success um, series that the provost provided for us, that students really appreciate the second chance and don't actually often know that they have a second chance. So what the Canvas Insights allowed is an email to go out to multiple students providing a growth mindset, come and talk to me, let's give you a second chance without actually saying it, and providing that one-on-one um, -on -one interaction to help them by offering campus resources and a problem-solving strategy. So just to review how I used um, Canvas Insights on my DFU class. I, I Again, I piloted it in the spring of 2010. I had 10 students I reached out to. I met with five of them. Two students, actually the email just worked and they just started coming back to class. So I never actually met with them. And then three students actually did receive a DFU. Um, they were the type of students who kind of signed up for the class and never actually showed back up to the class. The way that I use Canvas Insights made a difference in scaling up the personalization, especially with 110 students. Um, personalizing with those five students or those 10 students, sending out that personalized message. And again, I used the template that was already provided for me. And then when the students actually came into class, providing that support and offering that intrapersonal skills, um, finding out where they were and providing resources for them on campus here. So just to go back to my extensive framework that I've put together as far as my dissertation, we as faculty, we're only one small piece of the sense of belonging and the decision for a student to actually persist through college in their college journey. However, we are one critical piece in providing this experience here on campus for the faculty. And one of the tools that we can use, which we'll hear from many, um, is this Camp Insights to help with the students um, with the growth mindset to come up with a plan. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, Canvas Insights is a CSUN specific tool developed for CSUN by CSUN. Because it is, it is a CSUN tool, we have the ability to enhance it and shape it the way that it works for our, uh, for our faculty, based on faculty feedback. So some of the things we already have on the road, uh, roadmap that are based on the uh, faculty uh, comments is that we are looking into integrating filter for attendance. We also are looking into integrating filter that is, that, that is uh, specific to assignment name and assignment type with the grades for those assignments. And also is very exciting and important is our new partnership with Tsen College. With Tsen College, we are going to expand um, actually functional utility of uh, Canvas Insights and create an um, automated way to notify program coordinators uh, about some of the students that can be uh, falling behind. Those notifications will be set at the threshold according to the student success uh, model developed by uh, Tseng. And uh, overall, it will be a program level retention, automated retention tool at Tseng. So for those of you who are interested in more details, how to use Canvas Insights, uh, we are going to provide uh, Canvas Insights workshops at the Faculty Technology Center in OVA 30. One of them is 
tomorrow from 11 to 12 and more of them will be coming later and they all can be found on the um, faculty technology center calendar so with that thank you and this is how you can find us waiting to see if we have any questions okay. We have 159 Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> what other Canvas innovations are in the works? So the I cannot speak for Canvas as as a as a vendor. I'm sure they have something in the works. I know they recently released new grade book, uh, which, uh, and we have workshops uh, for that as well. As far as the Canvas Insights, which is the CSUN tool, as I mentioned, uh, we want to hear for, from faculty using Can Canvas Insights uh, to add new functionalities, new filters or new ways of automated and scaling personalization and, and um, other capabilities that will make it easier for faculty to outreach. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Chino Contreras. I graduated in 2018 with a bachelor's in sociology, emphasis criminology, criminal justice, a bachelor's in Chicana Chicano studies with a minor in civic and community engagement. I'm a current three year social work student here at California State University in Northridge in the social work program. And I'm here to introduce Dr. Acuna, someone who I met in my fifth year of undergrad when a new program was being introduced and piloted specifically to target males of color graduation and retention rates here on campus. This program was called Minority Male Mentoring, or M3. I met her as a student, then I became a mentee for the program. The following year, I was a recruiter and then became a mentor and facilitator. In these last three and a half years that I've known Dr. Acuna, she has been a mentor, a guide, a supervisor, and a support system for myself. And as I sat back and I thought about how to introduce her to someone who probably has not had the level of interaction that I've had with her, I couldn't come up with anything but this, hoping if you were in my shoes, you would be able to formulate something better than I have today. So these questions keep coming up. How do you introduce someone who has seen the finish line when you couldn't? How do you introduce someone who physically, emotionally, spiritually, and mentally embodies and personifies your family, your community, and everything that motivates you to be better, to do better, to continue to educate yourself despite the labels put upon you and your people? to continue in an institution where you have seen students and people like you criminalized and pushed to the side and where you usually don't see your community in positions of power and positions of motivation. How do you introduce someone who, when you can no longer continue, laid out the reasons why you could, when you lost your motivation, reminded you of your resilience without saying a lot? Dr. Acuna is a mentor, a strong head of color, a researcher, and a professor. Experiential wisdom and intellectual praxis breathes through Dr. Acuna's presence and she has always taken her time to pass her knowledge to those willing to show up for it. She is someone who is more than deserving of your applause, your respect, your love, and the blessings that come when the stars align with the universe. And to help further introduce who Dr. Acuna is, I will let my colleague and friend Jeremiah Buenrostro formally define who Dr. Acuna is and what she means to students like myself. Hi everyone, my name is Jeremiah Buenrostro. I'm currently an MSW student and former M3 mentor and mentee. Um, it's a privilege to introduce our next speaker, um, an amazing professor, mentor, and a social worker, Dr. Alejandra Acuna. She has dedicated her career and life to being of service to others and building hope for students and our communities. Dr. Acuna strongly believes in creating a pipeline for students of color 
specifically males who have the highest rates of enrolling into college but do not graduate, um, who also have dreams and ambitions of accessing higher education. The first time I had a pleasure of meeting Dr. Acuna, I was in my senior year in undergrad. Uh, she, she really had the gift of connecting and building relationships with others. She helps break stigmas and preconceived notions that I believe um, existed on my academic journey. That's what Dr. Acuna did for me. I've never imagined a life where I would be pursuing and obtaining a master's degree. Dr. Acuna helped me realize my potential as a male of color struggling to navigate this educational institution. Thank you, Jeremiah and David. <clears throat> So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alejandra Acuña. I'm an assistant professor of social work. My pronouns are she, her, and uh, she, hers, and ella. I'm here to talk about how faculty and students' connections, um, faculty and student connections can be fostered through stories of self. I'd like to begin with some basic premises and assumptions. First, we're social beings and our brains are wired to connect with others. Our best learning happens in the context of trusting relationships. We all, but particularly students of color, need to feel accepted, understood, and valued in an academic relationship and environment. And finally, the limbic system, that is the part of our brain which regulates emotion and memory, needs to feel safe, calm, and connected so that the prefrontal cortex can regulate thoughts, learning, and goal-directed actions. So given all this, how do we as faculty connect with students on the first day of class and throughout the semester? Is there a way that we can share our stories to help us connect with students? According to Marshall Gans, a former longtime United Farm Workers organizer and now Harvard professor, a story of self is a personal story and it shows why you were called to what you have been called to. Essentially, it tells students who we are and why we're here. Our story of self communicates our values. It presents, number one, a specific challenge we faced, number two, the choice we made about how to deal with the challenge, and three, the outcome we experienced. This story, our story, invites students to connect with us as faculty. Gans notes that because stories allow us to express our values, not as abstract principles, but as lived experience, they have the power to move others. By telling the story of self, a faculty member can establish grounds for trust, understanding, relationship, and belonging. The power in our story of self is to reveal something of those moments that were deeply meaningful to us in shaping our academic life. Not our deepest private secrets, but the events that shaped our academic journey. Learning to tell a good story of self demands the courage of introspection and of sharing some of what we find in that self-reflection. By being purposeful in our vulnerability, we can potentially serve as role models and instill hope in our students. So M3, which stands for Minority Male Mentoring or Minoritized Male Mentoring, um, developed a series of poster stories describing the academic journeys of men of color who are CSUN faculty, alumni, and students. The stories illustrate the ups and downs of higher education. So you see the uh, poster stories on the screen. These are two. Both are um, CSUN faculty members. So I'm going to read one story. And this is um, from uh, Dr. Jonathan Martinez, a, a professor of, um, in psychology. So his story is that as a first generation college student at UC Irvine, I was placed on academic probation, not once, but twice. I tried to ignore it, but more than anything, I was ashamed. I never told my parents out of fear of disappointing them, especially my mom. They had so much pride in their son that I did not want to crush their expectations of me. After I found my way and figured out how to successfully navigate the system, I graduated and felt so relieved that I did not let my parents down. But that was not enough. My goal was to pursue a PhD in clinical psychology. The first and second time I applied, I was flat out rejected. Similar to undergrad, something inside me kept me going despite the obstacles and challenges. 
but I was never alone in this quest. The support and guidance from my family and mentors was instrumental to my perseverance. I earned a PhD in clinical psychology from UCLA in 2013, which was something I could never have imagined while on academic probation. But I made it here, and I belong. So we asked CSUN students about the impact that these poster stories had on them because they're posted all over campus. Um, the two that you see on the screen, as well as about nine others from faculty, I'm from alumni and students. And a few themes emerged in the student responses. Um, first, we found a theme I call universality, which is the belief that I am not alone. And um, David's gonna read the quotes from students um, reflecting this theme. I'm not alone. We share the same life experiences. I honestly got goosebumps reading these stories due to the past experiences of mine replaying in my head. I feel inspired because I too was on academic probation and I was even disqualified and now I'm back in my senior year. Thanks to those men on the posters, I feel less alone and more motivated to continue on my path. Makes me feel like I belong too. I feel like I'm not alone in my struggles because I know that I'm not the only one facing such difficulties. Reading the posters gives me more motivation to continue pushing through in order to create my own story. Thank you, David. Students also told us that the posters illustrated important lessons. And so Jeremiah will read the student quotes on that theme. We all need someone to talk to that understands us and what we go through daily and what we've been through. I found them to be inspiring and a way of, to remember where I came from and what I'm ultimately trying to achieve to change the cycle of my life is supposed to end up. The stories are really powerful as they describe a story of overcoming life obstacles. Normally, one would use these obstacles as an excuse, but the stories on the posters are testaments that anything can be overcome, no matter the predicament one finds himself in very inspiring and motivating to actually take serious pride in school and ask for help in regards to taking advantage of the resources at CSUN. Thank you, Jeremiah. And then finally, a third theme was identified, and the third theme was related to inspiring positive emotions. And David will, will read those during course. I felt determined and motivated to continue to work hard and excel as a first-generation college student. It makes me feel like I belong too, encouraging, motivating, and relatable. I like hearing their downfalls and not just their accomplishments. Shows truth and speaks louder. I felt empowered as if I should have written my own story to help others feel they belong. <coughs> Feelings of hope. They are all very inspiring. Makes the struggles I'm going through look less intimidating. Others who have gone through their struggles have succeeded, so there's no reason why I can't either. The experiences of those students are inspiring and send a strong vibe and connection. I feel a sense of a warm hug. It gives me inspiration. Me, as a male minority, I sometimes feel ill-motivated, but oftentimes seeing and reading the stories of those powerful individuals makes me feel like I can make it too. These posters are essential for a person of color like me. They serve as great reminders and inspiration. I often study late and walk past these posters, which create confidence. Thank you, David. I'd like to highlight what we know about the importance of positive emotions. Research tells us that individuals need to experience a five to one ratio of positive to negative feelings, interactions, or experiences in order to optimize our health and well being. This five to one ratio also predicts the likelihood that we will stick around in a relationship. If you're familiar with Gottman and Gottman's research on longevity and divorce and marriages, they found a five to one ratio of positive to negative interactions as significantly predictive of couples who stay together. So how are we doing in terms of this five to one ratio in faculty student relationships on campus and in the classroom? This is a critical question for self reflection as it has a role to play in student retention. So let's get to our stories. A plot begins with a challenge and a choice. The choice yields an outcome and the outcome teaches a lesson. Because we can empathetically identify with the character, when we hear about someone's courage, we're also inspired by it. The story of a faculty member and their choices encourages students to think about their own values and challenges and inspires them with new ways of thinking about how to make choices in their own academic lives. 
So I'm going to ask you after this um, webinar to develop your own story of self. And you'll find a story of self handout um, as part of the Provost um, series website um, later in the week. Um, and I'm going to ask you to answer the following questions related to a challenge you faced, the choices you made, and the outcome you experienced. So for the challenge, I want you to ask yourself, why do you feel it was a challenge? What was challenging about it? Why was it your challenge? And in terms of choice, why did you make the choice you did? Where did you get the courage or not? Where did you get the hope or not? Did your parents or grandparents' life stories teach you in any way how to act in that moment? How did that feel? And then in terms of outcome, how did the outcome feel? Why did it feel that way? What did it teach you? What do you want to teach students about student success? How do you want students to feel? After you draft a story of self, I'd like you to share your story with someone and get their feedback. Ask them what images they found most vivid, what moments moved them, and how they understood your values as the storyteller. You may learn how to express your story of self more clearly as you tell it repeatedly, so your story may change over time. I invite you to tell your story to students. You'd be surprised at the impact it has on them in terms of lessons learned, feeling connected and less alone, and positive emotions. Thank you for your interest in student success. I invite you to stay connected. And I'd like to finish with this um, by sharing an old Jewish saying. Question, what is truer than the truth? Answer, the story. My hope is that your shared story with students can serve as a foundation of trust in a fruitful academic relationship. We're open for questions. <clears throat> Um, how do students um, learn about the MP program? How do they find out about it? You guys want to take that one? Well, being in the master's program and being um, I was part of all the sex, like a re recruiting, um, being a facilitator, being a mentor, all you need to do is go to Sierra Hall, um, find Dr. Lipscomb or Dr. Acuna and ask about the program. You can see the posters. Um, M3 is spread out. You have a lot of uh, mentors, a lot of resources here on campus. So if you ask about it, definitely find somebody who's connected with M3 one yeah. way or another. There's an office on the first floor. And it's called like the Student Success Corridor. You'll see the office, the M3 and the Student Success Allies office there. And there are um, mentors, uh, graduate students who would be happy to help. And also there's- um, The website as well. You can um, find that at uh, www csunm3.com. But how do students who don't know to even look for it, how do they find it? I mean, is, it is it discussed at orientation? Um, so what kind of outreach? So we also um, do outreach to different, um, different uh, buildings. We do presentations, actually. They, they last from like five to seven minutes, and we give all that information with all the mentors' um, emails and how to contact us. So we actually do outreach through presentations. Yeah. So if you're a professor who would like a classroom presentation, then you just uh, email us, and we'll send somebody out to your class. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be here. We have a presentation from University Counseling Services 
What Students Don't Tell Professors, a presentation on boosting student success. I am Dr. Dan Alonzo, one of the staff psychologists at University Counseling Services, and I am joined today by my colleagues, Dr. Elizabeth Polisco, Dr. Pat Alfred Keating, and Dr. Abram Milton. So we want to thank, first of all, the members of the Student Success Committee who asked us to present, and we also want to thank the provost for making all of this happen. So we clinical faculty, we're happy to be here, and we occupy a unique position at Cal State Northridge because we get to hear about student success from the students themselves. Students come into University Counseling Services with a variety of concerns, some of them serious, some of them very serious, but students almost always talk about their academic experiences here at CSUN, and they are not shy about telling us about their professors. But they are afraid to tell professors because they know that you professors evaluate them. So we wanted to share some of that with you and see if we can help us all think about helping students achieve a sense of belonging and also to help them boost their academic success. So we have a little bit of a warm up activity, which is going to be a little bit different than the way it's displayed on the slide because we're not doing this with a live audience. But what we'd like you to do for a moment is to reflect on someone who had a positive and maybe tremendous impact on your academic achievement. Maybe it can be someone who played a role in your childhood and adolescent years, but we think it would be more valuable for you to reflect on someone from your undergraduate or graduate program who had a very positive impact on your achievement. If you can take a few seconds and reflect on who that person might be, and if um, anyone would like to send in a, just a brief description of that person, we are able to receive that feedback, and if not, we'll just keep moving forward. So we'll wait for just a few seconds. And maybe, hi, this is Dr. Elizabeth Polisco. Maybe something that you could type about isn't necessarily the name of the person, although it can be, but maybe aspects about their behavior or personality or things that, that helped you feel safe and comfortable with them. Well, they're still reflecting, which is good. <laughs> That's what we asked you to do, so yeah. thank you. I mean, I could share. Okay, go right ahead. I went, I went to school. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I'm not trying to give away our presentation, but I'm just thinking um, some of the things that made some of my instructors or professors um, approachable were um, authenticity um, and warmth people who seemed like experts who i who i respected in their field uh i like humor so mm -hmm. I, I seem to connect better with professors who added a sprinkle of humor now and then any you have one comment it says peer went through a similar struggle uh, okay thank you thank you for sending that Okay, I'm gonna pass this over now to Elizabeth. Elizabeth? Yep, I'm still here. So um, what we're, we thought we would be helpful is to share with you some of the positive, oh, 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 we got some. We got some coming through on Talk to me, yes. Um, as, the only, as the only two women on a research project, my dissertation chair told me we would not be typing meeting notes. She wanted us to have a place at the table not be secretaries. Another one, someone who had a tremendous impact on my academic achievement was Addie Lou Klotz, for whom our health center oh, is wow. named. And um, I had an English professor who was such a great listener and became a lifelong mentor, and he was not from my background. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, and I'm sure as we as we talk about this, you might have other thoughts or ideas popping into your mind and feel free to share them. Um, 
we wanted to share with you some of the positive comments and statements that we've heard from students who come to University Counseling Services. So our CSUN students, what they're saying. And these are the helpful behaviors and attributes that we hear about, about you know, the CSUN faculty um, out there. So these are behaviors and attributes that are extremely important to students that have helped them felt help them feel a sense of belonging um, that have helped motivate them to come to class and to persist in classes. Uh, many of our students deal with incredibly difficult life circumstances. Many of them struggle with mental health challenges of stress and overwhelm, and they also struggle uh, with things that are sometimes severe. So when they come in and share with us the things that are also helping them persist, we thought we'd like to pass that information along to y'all. Um, so when you demonstrate these behavior and attributes, it does mean a lot. Uh, some of the things that we've heard, oh cool, you're doing that for me, thank you. Uh, when professors ask us to make nameplates so that they can see who we are and get to know us faster. When professors in small or medium-sized classes take time to learn our names. When professors talk about their own struggles when they were younger or when they were in our shoes, and that really reminds me of uh, Dr. Acuna's re just presentation two seconds ago. Um, uh, when professors use their sense of humor. When professors look happy to see us when we come to their office hours or come ask them questions after class. When professors tell us something that is wrong, when professors tell us that something is wrong, and then ask us what's going on, if they've noticed something coming up for us. Maybe we won't wanna talk about it, but we notice that they notice. Oh, oh, uh. When professors break up the class and do several things during one class, so a little bit of lecture, a short video, some small group work. Um, when professors are patient and explain things to us one-on-one, -on -one, after class, during office hours, or even when they open it up and explain it to a broader group of, of um, students, because students are watching not just how you interact with them, but how you're interacting with their, co with their, their cohorts. When professors remember that they're teaching us, people, real people, it's not just about the subject matter. When professors are kind, respectful, inviting, and approachable. And when professors remember and treat us like we're adults. I think we had a couple more yes. comments about positive attributes or things that professors have done for our own CSUN faculty. Uh, the instructors who took me seriously, not only admiring for my strength, but also told me where my weaknesses were. And we have one more here. Let me scroll down. My PhD advisor was extremely mindful and respectful of the fact that I had a different academic background than most people in the department. Mm -hmm. He was always available to talk about what I personally needed to do better and make up for that deficit. And he was always glad to talk about the stresses and anxieties I had throughout my dissertation work. That's excellent. Thank you all so much for sharing um, your personal experiences with us. That's kind of what Dr. Cunha is recommending in general is being authentic and sharing our, our stories with our students. And we're hearing that students like like to hear that and like to see us um, as, as people, um, people teaching people. So uh, the next slide is about the research findings. So we're, we were approaching helping students achieve academic and, and life success um, from the lens of a sense of belongingness and connect, a connection to campus. So here's some research findings. Uh, when, we, when we talk about sense of belonging, uh, we are looking at a student's perceived, and I think that was mentioned earlier, shout out to Dr. Brusasco, whoop. Um, perceived social support on campus, a feeling of connectedness, and the experience of mattering or feeling cared about, accepted, respected, valued, and important to the campus community or others on campus, such as faculty, staff, and peers. So everyone matters their connections to peers matter, their connections to staff, and their connections to faculty. And it's that perceived sense of belonging that really has an impact. And then we went into the literature and uh, looked at, well, what, how does that matter? What does sense of belonging do for our students? Um, 
Tinto in 1987, one of the seminal studies, looked at the quality of student uh, faculty interaction and the students' integration into the school as central factors in students' attrition. In a review of the literature, Hussman et al. Uh, found that students' subjective sense of belonging is related to positive educational outcomes such as GPA, such as satisfaction, such as commitment and persistence. And Juan et al. in 2019 found that academic help seeking is one positive, sense, positive outcome of a student's sense of belonging. So it's not just the touchy-feely experience of feeling connected or belonging. That perceived sense of connection on campus impacts their academic success. Oh. And so now we've talked about things that help build or, or feedback that we've heard from our own CSUN students that help build a sense of um, connection and help students feel important and engaged in their academics. Now we're going to shift to talk about some of the obstacles that students have expressed experiencing here at CSUN. And so we will be hearing from Abram Milton. And as I turn it over to him, let me please remind everyone that Although we are yes. therapists, we have all taught before. We ourselves have been in front of classrooms, and we know how hard this is. So uh, students have probably said the same things about our classes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Hey, thank you, Dan. Um, as we're going on, as we highlight some of the obstacles they tell us about, and they really are afraid to tell each and every one of you, we see this in um, our sessions uh, all the time. So some of these things you can see on, I'm just gonna highlight some themes that come from this. So when professors say one thing in the syllabus, but then there are new requirements that we never heard of. You know, sometimes I feel like on some of this can be a good modeling um, right in that moment for those students about how the openness of the faculty to be able to allow them to have that kind of feedback and how it works. So this openness, this transparency that comes up. Which comes into number two, understanding. You know, some students talk about understanding the syllabus should not be a guessing game, right? So if um, with the faculty, if they are kind of being open, if um, while you're in the class, if you are setting it up where they can um, present some of their thoughts, and things like that, that can kind of set this kind of connection, that can set this initial belongingness that can facilitate future things within the class. Now with this, we have this number three that I wanted Elizabeth to kind of mention because she had an interesting story. So, I wanna highlight that I think not all, I think a lot of professors are doing a really good job and doing their best at being approachable and creating a safe environment. And that sometimes there are struggles that we're not even aware of, that we do things with the best intentions and aren't aware of how different students may react. Um, so I know that there, I definitely know that there are professors out there that students are able to talk to and share with, and there are some that are not. I had a student who, uh, so this bullet point is when the syllabus says no late papers will be accepted or there will be no exceptions. Um, and that, I just challenge people to think about the anxiety that that creates within the student to see in bold capital, no exceptions, uh, period. Uh, sometimes that prohibits people from sharing really important life altering news uh, because of that, that communication. Um, for example, I did have a student who was suddenly um, homeless, or I've had students who had a death of a parent um, and were able to tell professors who you know, said, come talk to me, it's on a case by case basis. They were able to approach them and share, this is what's going on, I don't know what to do, versus um, same student dropped a class with one of the professors because they were just so anxious about sharing this pretty significant event. Uh, so thinking about how we're communicating and our level of openness to students. And I realize that there's a risk in, in opening the floodgates of everything is acceptable versus everything is not exceptions, um, but really thinking about how we're communicating that to our students. 
And continuing on, some more obstacles that students in by some of these comments that we hear within our sessions. Like they say, we are clearly aware of differential treatment in the classroom when a professor calls on the same student over and over. We see it. And I say on that, sometimes that with the students, that thing they come up is, I feel like I'm not important. Right, when they, when, you know, when, as they are talking with us, maybe in sessions. Or like that next one, when they say, if a professor ignores a student or makes a harsh comment, we also see that too, right? Some of the students, they come in our office and they, they get this feeling like, I'm not good enough within that, right? Well, that last bullet when we're talking about on this, when a professor, um, professors are not there during the office hours. Some of them may have this feeling as they present it with us and saying, hey, my success, my success as a student does not matter. And yet the final obstacle that I'm gonna uh, highlight on is that some professors don't understand that there are some circumstances that are beyond our control, right? And you can see the rest of that um, with on the slide, but there's one thing about this thing about saying um, that I have to be perfect. There's a lot of them saying, hey, if the professor's saying there's no, no other kind of ways to get past this, that I have to be perfect, this perfectionism that they come within themselves. And so we do a lot of work to try to assist um, them on exploring that. But these are just kind of some basic themes and obstacles. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague, Pat, to highlight a few more. Thank you. And so moving forward with this uh, about obstacles, another one is when a professor seems so absorbed really in his or her lecture that he or she basically doesn't realize that the class is checked out. And when that happens as students, we feel disconnected and, and we feel less interested too. Or when the professors tell us that what's going to be on the test, uh, they tell us that and then they pull a switcheroo basically. And when that happens and there's something different that we weren't expecting, then we feel distressed and betrayed. But what I really wanna focus on is the last slide here, which is dealing with mental health issues, because mental health issues present a tremendous challenge for our students that definitely interfere with student success. So some of us have crippling anxiety, social anxiety that makes group participation painful, or we have panic attacks when we make class presentations, or we blank out on tests and do poorly, though we've studied and studied. Some of us are so depressed that we simply can't get out of bed and we may tell ourselves messages like, you don't belong here or you're a loser. Others of us have suffered traumas and experienced flashbacks when we're trying to watch a film in class or we get emotionally triggered by, reading, by readings or class discussions. Some of us have thoughts of killing ourselves and some of us have already tried. We have thoughts like, I could jump off the balcony and all the pain would go away. We're doing the best we can, and sometimes we're scared to tell you what we're going through. And I wanna say, you can imagine that serious mental health issues affect students' sense of belonging. Uh, I wanna quickly cover a Collegiate Mental Health Annual Report in 2019 covering 163 university counseling centers with about 208,000 participants. The finding was that depression and anxiety has really skyrocketed, which may not be any surprise to any of you, but trauma has increased over the past six years. 41% of students coming into university counseling centers have experienced a traumatic event and 39% have had suicidal ideation in the last two weeks. 10% have made suicide attempts. So we hope that we can work collaboratively together to help students get the help they need for removing the mental health obstacles that interfere with their success. Now we're going to talk about small doable steps to help students feel more connected with you and in the classroom. Um, and I think this really is going to align with Dr. Acuna's message about 
sharing stories of self, uh, but we wanted to scale it back into things that are more doable and, and, and smaller scale within the classroom while you're interacting with your students. And this is based on research and CSUN student feedback. So here are just a small list of steps that instructors can take to create a safe environment and a sense of belonging. So making eye contact with your students, with all of your students um, throughout the course. Um, calling students by their name. So for some people, it's helpful to have name tents or hanging folders over the desk with names in large print. And for students who it's more challenging or you're not quite sure how to say their name, asking them for the phonetic spelling or a recording of their name so that when you do call on them in class, you're using their name as it's supposed to be used. Um, I think this, a couple of the bullet points in here really align with our earlier um, session on Canvas Insights. Uh, there's a recommendation that uh, you send a note, a note congratulating students who were successful on an early exam or paper or who have substantially improved sharing, showing that you notice that they've improved or that they're working or doing well. And also reaching out to those who didn't do so well to express your willingness to help them. And I think that was what we were talking about or what y'all were talking about earlier with the Canvas Insight and early detection and reminders that it really does matter to students and it helps them feel heard and seen. And if they are going through some of the, those mental health issues that Dr. Pat recently you know, just shared about, having someone reach out and notice is, is significant. When you talk, and I think this relates to Dr. Acuna's presentation, when you talk content and only content, you run the risk of losing that human connection with them. So it's okay to share a photo of a pet or offer personal insight that is relevant to the topic. Maybe you're, you're not ready to share your full story or a sense of self story that could be helpful, but if you aren't at that point or aren't comfortable with taking that risk or sharing that much, anything. Students devour anything that we share about ourselves as human beings. Share about your home life, a favorite TV show, uh, things that you binge Netflix on or stuff that you like, a good meal that you had. Share some of who you are as a person and that will help them feel more engaged. And it's also good modeling. We have a lot of commuter students at our school that have difficulty making connections with their peers. I'm going rogue here for a second. They have difficulty making connection with their peers. They're so ingrained in their um, social media and their computers that the interaction, the human interaction um, sometimes is challenging. So if you're modeling for them, hey, I'm a human, this is what I like, this is what I'm into, it, it kind of can provide for them a guide on how to make connections with others. And then uh, check in with students who have missed a class. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and we'd like you to think for a minute about what small steps, small doable steps that you currently take that can invite students into a place of safety, learning, or even excitement. And again, it was our intention to have you talk to someone sitting close to you at the, uh, at the seminar. But um, if any of you would like to send in some comments about what currently you do, what small doable steps that you can take, such as those that Elizabeth just reviewed, that would be great. Um, so we know that we are out of time. We want you to know that um, you are here and you're listening to this because you care. So we really thank you for listening to our students. And we hope that this presentation has been helpful in remembering what students are really thinking and how much they appreciate it when you recognize them and validate them for who they are. So thank you all very much. And are we gonna, do we have a minute to hear feedback from faculty across the campus? Yes. Of the small doable things that you're currently doing? Mm -hmm. Yes. So we are, we are ready. While there, thank you too. Another thing occurred to me when I was hearing you talk about the importance of learning their names, which I think is really important, is being sensitive to their pronouns too. Uh, that can make a huge difference to certain students. 
in the, um, the references slide, there is an article from 2019, Safi and Hogan want to reach all of your students. Here's how to make your teaching more inclusive. The Chronicle of Higher Education, it does list uh, different small steps, one of them being gender, uh, sharing yours and, and modeling uh, gender pronouns. A couple comments. Um, great, it's very informative to learn the different ways uh, to student success from each presentation. And here's another one. Um, I do a brief beginning of the semester survey to help me learn their backgrounds and interests. Mm -hmm. I can then incorporate their interests into course material. Right? Yeah. Give me a personal spin on that. Uh -huh. And we're inviting any more, anything else you'd like to share? You just, uh, here's a question. Um, do you have any suggestions for faculty members who have similar social anxiety issues with things like eye contact or confrontation? Okay. Well, I, I will, the first thing that comes to mind is um, one, I think, and I'm not an HR person, so I can't really talk to that, but I do know that um, we have EAP, Employee Assistance Program, where you can get some support related to uh, different topics. Um, and I think, I think eye contact is a really uh, complex uh, topic, given um, different cultural perspectives and different experiences. Um, it can be challenging. Uh, I think I would recommend reaching out to the EAP uh, program and maybe having a more in-depth conversation about your your personal experience with with eye contact and some of the things that might get in the way. Does anybody else have any ideas? Just an additional thought that uh, sometimes um, it can help to just think about things differently. And although it's okay. certainly something like this can be challenging, perhaps it can also be seen as an opportunity to practice um, doing something that initially is uncomfortable, but the more you do it, the more comfortable you will probably become. Mm -hmm. But I really, really want to thank you for your question. It's an excellent question, and I think it's one that um, many professors may occasionally struggle with. So thank you. Should we? You know what I realized we didn't do? Um, I just want to make faculty, anybody who's listening, aware that we offer 24-7, 365 day a year crisis support. So if your two currently enrolled CSUN students, so if your students are sharing something that is of concern um, or they are sharing that they would like to get help, you can have them call us 24-7, 365 days a year at 818. 677-2366. They can also walk in Monday through Friday, 9 to 4, uh, to Byramian mm -hmm. Hall, Suite 520, where they can be seen on an um, urgent walk-in case basis. Uh, so the phone number is a 24-7 option. They could walk in Monday through Friday. Also, I think it's important for all of us to know there is also a 24-hour crisis text line. So for students who have social anxiety or difficulty talking to people either on the phone or in person, the 24-7 crisis text line, they would text, and this isn't just for CSUN students, sorry, it is nationwide. It's 741-741. The other thing I want to say while I have the mic is um, if you have questions or concerns about your students, we are here as consultants as well. So if you had anything that you weren't unsure about, you can call our center during business hours and connect with one of us to get some feedback or to brainstorm how to help our students. That's All right. Great. I have a comment and a couple questions here. <laughs> um, it does matter to students when professors know them by name and notice when they miss class. Mm -hmm. Dr. Michael Neubauer told me how he spoke to a student who missed his class and she was so stunned that he noticed. Mm -hmm. Just this action changed her demeanor and interest in the class. Uh, we have a question here. 
Uh, how do we help our colleagues see the importance of supporting students' uh. non-academic concerns how this, and how this translates into student success? Oh, okay, I got some stuff if you don't. <laughs> yeah, so this is Abram again. So um, as we see on this, we're talking about fellow, fellow faculty and about how we can kind of empower them or make them more aware on some of these things. I always say, because I, I know I, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was kind of giving a talk on this topic, talking about steel, sharpened steel. I mean, we, I can kind of relate that to within this conversation per se is about how sometimes with faculty, with some of these different um, faculty retreats, these students assist um, kind of stories and some of these other things where people can share information can be good resources to help um, kind of normalize the experience. But I think definitely on some of these things with some people, maybe even the modeling can help, um, can help them as far as being more willing um, and then being compassionate um, to that faculty as well, just like how we would want to do with some of the students and some of that normalizing. Mm -hmm. some other thoughts? Well, my, my other thought is we often, I often, I'll speak for myself, get students who don't, who say they don't have time for self-care or pleasant activities mm -hmm. because they need to be focusing on academics. They need to be doing their homework. They need to be preparing for this and that. And they get so entrenched in the academic and the pressure to get things done that they get out of balance. And when they're out of balance, they're not performing at their optimal. So being able, and, and so I think maybe what I would share with a, a faculty or staff who had questions about, you know, the, the non-academic parts of, of students' lives is to share that when students have balance, when students are socially engaged, when they're exercising, when they're having meaningful interactions with their family or friends, that helps them to be more successful in their academics. And the research has shown that. All right, we have another question. Um, other than uh, sharing the crisis line or counseling services yeah. information, what would you recommend if a student does not want to disclose the details of his or her situation, but is obviously in distress? I, I can go, or does somebody else want to go? Go for start. it. Yeah. And please, if others help fill mm -hmm. in here. But that is difficult, because definitely the, the best line is to ultimately get them to help with a, with a therapist who can get down and dirty with them and help them through this process. But sometimes that isn't the case, and I think we don't want to invite students to overshare when we're in our professional role as, as a professor. But we can still provide a lot of support and encouragement and compassion and make it clear we care that they're struggling in these ways. And I, again, reinforcing though that there are resources that can help them. I just wanted to echo what Pat said about if somebody is not wanting to share, we don't want to force them to do something that they're not ready or comfortable doing and providing those resources um, and expressing concern can be a really big step in helping them. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is open the floodgates. Um, we, as our, our faculty, we uh, do outreach and consultation. So we will go out to different departments mm -hmm. um, and we do an outreach on for faculty and staff on assisting students in distress. We also have an outreach on um, QPR, which is question, persuade, respond refer thank you mm -hmm. um, and that's for uh, working or talking with students who have had uh, expressed some suicidal ideation so there are um, there is a general assisting students in distress that we can offer to your department or uh, a whole college um, or there is the question persuade refer uh, that helps give you language for talking with students who are expressing mental health um, or safety concerns. So we have another question here, which is, I think a lot of the uh, presenters today might be able to answer, but I'll pose it first to the Counseling Center. 
Uh, the question is, how do faculty promote connectedness and self sense of belonging with huge class sizes such as 150 to 200 students? <laughs> Someone coming. So hi, this is Joyce Marie Brasosco calling the uh, calling. Oh, good grief! Uh, but I teach uh, often. I teach the large lecture classes. One, I'll just do a shout out to the E Learning Institute, and I learned how to create communities through Zoom. Mm -hmm. We're using Zoom as a technology right now, and um, thanks a call out to Tim to actually helping us as well with using Zoom communities. Um, as, as a way to actually have smaller communities and have them talk to each other. So uh, that same semester that I used the Canvas Insights, I also created smaller Zoom communities in groups of 10. Mm -hmm. And then within the large lecture, I had them come together and um, meet in their groups in a very difficult discussion on abuse in the family. And um, they really, really enjoyed that and did an exercise throughout the uh, Jacaranda Hall by, there was an exercise, I can't remember what it's called, but faculty development would know, um, where you put up some uh, poster boards around the room and each group go and they mm. talk, they kind of give their responses. And that was a really good sense of community for a very large lecture class um, but it did take uh, honestly a lot of work ahead of time yeah. to put these small communities together and I did utilize them later I'm doing it this semester as well and much smaller class by creating these zoom communities and then utilizing them in small groups inside the classroom to talk about these difficult dis um, discussions that you guys were talking about um, that we do include in this marriage and family class so that's just one idea do we have any other questions? We can open it for all of the presenters at this point. I'll give you a few minutes to think of a question and type it in before we make the decision to wrap up. Pat, Pat wants to say something. Well, while we're waiting, I just want to also mention that at University Counseling Services, we have a thriving groups program, and this actually is an excellent way for students to feel connected mm -hmm. on campus. These, these groups sometimes last a year or even longer. They're varying um, amounts of time that they last for, but students find it to be very helpful in this commuter ca campus where it's hard to connect. All right, I don't see any questions coming in. Oh, we just got something. Uh, in terms of fostering belonging and community, do you have any suggestions for the specific case of an online only class where there aren't things like eye contact or calling on people by name? Mm -hmm. So Joyce, Joyce would go back to the creating the Zoom the Zoom classrooms and the smaller Zoom groups. <laughs> Canvas Insights. Yes, because the the so the this is Helen. This is Helen. The third thing. Thank you. The issue is that. Uh, in large and online environment, there there is very little person-to-person -person connection. So, to scale that or or even um, mimic that kind of personal connection, if you use Canvas Insights to provide positive reinforcement, the pat uh, on the back, and you can do it on scale, uh, it will be personalized by a student's first name, so the connection will be uh, right there. And um, that, that's in addition to needing help, but speaking to what Elizabeth, Elizabeth was saying in terms of positive uh, feedback that can be certainly utilized. Sometimes certain students want just to get together if they're if they know each other or something like that. I guess they don't need it then. But the Zoom allows for some eye contact, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's helpful.
We have a question about uh, the M3 website, so I'm going to get clarification on that. So I usually just Google CSUN M3, and uh, it'll take me to it, but let me see. The official website is, so it's um, csun.edu backslash M3. All right, I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in to this fifth event in the series, particularly on short notice. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I know that I sat here and took tons of notes of things that I want to implement in the U100 classes. Um, I want to let you know that the slides will be available on the Student Success website by the end of the week, and the recording will also be available soon. And with that, I would say good afternoon. Have a great, have a great day. Uh -huh.